What's up guys, this is Chris McCormick and welcome to my Q&A video on hierarchical softmax. So HS is a technique that you can apply to any neural network that has the softmax function as its activation function on the output layer. But maybe the case that you've encountered it in is in uh, training a word to vec model. So if you use a library like GenSim, then maybe you've seen one of the parameters kind of nestled in here with all the others is that you've got to choose between either using hierarchical softmax or negative sampling. And both of these are techniques for greatly reducing the compute cost of training a word to vec model. And it's not like, you know, 20% difference or something like that. It's like four or five orders of magnitude, depending on how large your vocabulary is. So without using one of these two techniques, a word to vec model is, you know, essentially infeasible to train. So hierarchical softmax then is a technique for approximating the softmax function. And what that means is that your model will still learn the softmax behavior and you can still get those softmax values out of it if you want them. But it implements it in a way that greatly reduces the compute cost of training your neural network. Now, before we get into the explanation of how hierarchical softmax is implemented, let's do a quick refresh on what the softmax function is and why it causes such a compute problem for us with the word to vec model. So you've probably used it before in maybe like in an introductory machine learning class where you do the classic uh, MNIST handwritten digit example. So you make a three layer neural network with a hidden layer, it takes in an image of a handwritten digit, multiplies that with all the hidden neurons, sends those to each of 10 output neurons, one for each of the 10 digits. And for each of those, you get some value that re reflects the probability that the, uh, the model thinks that the input is that digit. So let's say 0 0.01 and 2% chance that it's the digit one. And if it's trained well, then hopefully, you know, this is a nice high value, maybe 75% and I don't know, maybe 13% there. And so these are all probabilities and the softmax function guarantees that these all sum to 1.0. So you get a probability distribution over the outputs. And the way that it does this is with this denominator term of the softmax function. So to calculate the activation value for the number zero, we take the output of the hidden layer and multiply it with the weights for this output neuron and then apply the exponential function as an activation. But then we also have to divide that by the sum of the activation values for all 10 digits. And what that means is that, let's say we're training on this image of the number eight. We don't get to just update the weights for the number eight we have to update the weights for all 10, uh, all 10 outputs. And that's fine for MNIST because we only have 10 outputs. But with word to vec we can have easily 100,000 outputs. And that's because we have one output for uh, every word in our vocabulary. A good word model is trained on millions to billions of individual word pairs, an input word and an output word. And if we have to update the weights for 100,000 neurons for every single one of those word pairs, that's just an insane amount of compute. So negative sampling, without going into too much detail, addresses this by essentially giving up on the softmax behavior. We get rid of the softmax activation function and go back to just our trusty old sigmoid function. And essentially the model, instead of becoming, you know, 100,000 outputs that are all interdependent, we end up with essentially 100,000 logistic regression classifiers that are all independent of each other. And when we train on a, a particular input word, we train the output word as the positive sample and then we randomly choose five other words to use as our negative samples. So instead of training on 100,000 outputs, we just train on six.
So negative sampling loses that softmax behavior, but the real point of this, the real point of the word model is to learn good word vectors. And negative sampling seems to work. It produces good word vectors. Another approach that also works well is the hierarchical softmax technique. And that one does preserve the softmax behavior. So in the rest of this video, we'll go through the hierarchical softmax technique. And I actually took this content directly from my online course on word to vec So if you really want to master word to vec then you should definitely check this out. I talk through illustrations like we're doing right now, but there's also a lot of hands-on work with Python. And over the course, you'll actually get to implement the full word to vec algorithm from scratch in Python, which I think is a really cool accomplishment once you get there. So I'll make sure to drop the link, give it a look, you won't be disappointed. Hierarchical softmax, or HS, is another approach to this problem. It's a way of approximating the softmax such that we still get that probability distribution and we still get to keep our nice interpretation to what the model's objective is, but with less accuracy on the output and with a greatly reduced compute cost during training. So let's talk through how this works. It is going to take a little bit of explaining. So for starters, HS requires that our vocabulary be organized into a binary tree. So a binary tree is just one where all of the internal nodes, all these blue circles, have exactly two branches. And then all of our vocabulary words are going to be the leaves of this tree. And what's interesting is that HS can actually work with any organization of tree that you could come up with. So you could actually just randomly build this tree and place the, the words at random leaves. But if you do that, it won't be as accurate. So the tree building scheme that we're going to be using for word to vec is called a Huffman tree. And the main thing you need to know about a Huffman tree is that it's going to organize the words such that rare words are down at deeper levels and frequent words are at shallower levels. So the path along the tree to get to a infrequent word is longer. We'll talk about why that's a good strategy in a little while here, but for now, just take it for granted that our vocabulary is organized in this way. So let's say we have this imaginary tiny vocabulary with just eight words in it. The, of, respond, active, plutonium, acetic, arbitrarily, and chupacabra. Now, with negative sampling and with our original softmax formulation, every row of both the input matrix and the output matrix corresponded to a specific word in our vocabulary. Now, with hierarchical softmax, every row of the input matrix is still associated with a word, but that's no longer the case for the output matrix. Instead, we're going to associate each row of our output matrix with one of these blue internal nodes. So we need to give each of these nodes a row ID. So I'm gonna call this one row zero, and this one row one, and two, and three, four, five, and six. And notice that we have seven internal nodes, but eight vocabulary words. So that's a fundamental property of binary trees. We're always gonna have one less internal node than we are gonna have leaves. That's true if the vocabulary was uh, an odd number as well. So if we remove the word of, for instance, then we'd also take out this blue node. And then we'd have seven vocab words, but uh, six internal nodes. Now let's say we've got the training pair chupacabra comma active. So we're using the skipgram model, and chupacabra is the word at the center of our context window, and active is the current context word that we're trying to learn. What we're going to do is we're going to train our model to tell us how to navigate this tree to get to the word active. So we start by looking up the input vector for chupacabra. Which, by the way, if you're not familiar, uh, Chupacabra is an urban legend, kind of like Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster. And we're going to take that word vector, and we're going to start at the root node, number six. So we take the dot product between the word vector and with whatever is in row six of the output matrix, 
then we'll apply the sigmoid activation function and get some kind of activation value here between 0 and 1. And the way we're going to interpret these activation values is we're going to say that a 0 means go left and a 1 means go right. So for this training sample, we're going to tell it to go right. So that means we want it to output a 1 on node 6. And then we're going to do the same thing for the next node, node 4. This time we want it to output 0 to tell us to go left. So we take the dot product, apply the sigmoid activation function, gives us some activation value, and the label we're going to give it is 0. We want it to output a 0. And finally, we do that for the last leg here. We want it to output a 1 at node 3. And that's it for this training sample. We just train on the outputs 3, 4, and 6. So it shares that property of negative sampling in that we're only going to train on a handful of the outputs rather than the entire vocabulary. So that's great, but this is a pretty bizarre architecture here. What is this output layer even trying to do? Well, we said that we're trying to approximate the regular softmax output layer. And that means that we need to be able to compute a probability for every word in our vocabulary. Meaning if the input word is chupacabra, then this model should be able to tell us for every word in the vocabulary what the probability is of a randomly selected context word being that word. So how would you get that? How would you get a probability distribution out of this crazy tree architecture? Well, let's take a look at how it works. Let's say that we've already finished training this model using the procedure that we saw on the last slide. And now we want to know for the input word chupacabra, what's the probability that a randomly chosen nearby word is the word plutonium. So the way we're going to calculate that is we're going to navigate this tree starting from the root node, node 6, and working our way down to the leaf node for our context word, plutonium. So I feed in the word vector for chupacabra, and I take its dot product with the row vector for node 6, apply the sigmoid, and then I'm going to get some activation value between 0 and 1. And we're just going to make up numbers here. So I'm going to say it's 0 0.28. Now the way we interpret that activation value is to say that 28% of the time, the context word will be found on the right-hand side of the tree. And that means that the other 62% of the time, the context word will be found on the left-hand side of the tree. So why is that the case? Well, to make the math simple, let's assume that our training corpus includes exactly 100 training samples where the input is chupacabra and the output word is various words from our vocabulary. So for these output values, apparently in 28 out of those 100 samples, the context word was found somewhere down the right-hand side of the tree. So that means 28 times we trained node 6 to output a 1 for the input word chupacabra. And then for the other 62 training samples, apparently the context word was found on the left-hand side of the tree. So we trained node 6 62 times to output a 0. So you can see how the node is learning the probabilities based on the statistics of our training examples. And again, these output values are specific to our input word because we fed in the input vector for that word. If our input word was actually active, then we'd be feeding in a different input vector and the probabilities at node 6 would be different. So the next step is to continue traversing down this tree from node 6 all the way down to our context word plutonium. And just to be clear, this whole binary tree structure is built as part of building our vocabulary. So for every word in the vocabulary, we can look up how to navigate this tree to get to that word. 
So if you went to the vocabulary and looked up the word plutonium, it would tell you take a right at node 6, and then a right at node 4, and a left at node 2, and a left at node 1. So we know the path that we need to take. So we know then at node 6 that we need to take a right. And next we need to calculate the probabilities at node 4. So we take the dot product between Chupacabra and the vector at row 4, apply the sigmoid, get some activation value. Let's just say it's 0 0.47. So that means 47% of the time, the answer can be found on the right side of the tree, and 53% of the time, when you're at node 4, the answer can be found on the left side of the tree. And we'll continue doing this all the way down to the leaf node for plutonium. We've calculated the probabilities at each node, and then we've circled the probabilities that are on the branch that we needed to take. And I think you can see that each node is further decomposing the probability from the node above it. As we move down a level, we're taking a fraction of a fraction, so the probabilities are getting smaller and smaller. And to find the final probability for the word plutonium, we, we just multiply all these probabilities together. So 0 0.28. And altogether, that just equals 0 0.07, meaning 7% 7 of the time, we'd expect that the context word would be the word plutonium. Now, if you really wanted to know the full probability distribution, then you would repeat this process for every word in the vocabulary, calculating the probability for each one. And it is guaranteed here that the probabilities will all sum up to 1.0. I think you can see that fairly intuitively just from observing how each node is just breaking up the probability of the node above it into smaller chunks, but the total all still sums up to 1.0. Now with word devec, of course, we're not actually interested in that probability distribution. We're just trying to train a model that's capable of producing that so that we can get good word vectors out of it as a byproduct. And the same big piece of intuition applies here as before. If the model needs to learn a very similar probability distribution for the words couch and the word sofa, then it's motivated to learn very similar input vectors for those two words.